right, I'm thrilled to be back and continue this discussion on Biffle's 9th Tennessee Cavalry. Uh, so let me take a couple minutes to review some key themes from the first part uh, we covered in last month's meeting. Uh, first, we talked some about the unit commander, uh, Jacob Biffle. He wasn't much about writing reports or communicating to his superiors, and he seems to run afoul of those in command. We also discussed the unit's formation where companies where the companies recruited and the partisan ranger concept they were recruited under. Uh, with the unit being formed in an area behind enemy lines and in the communities of divided loyalties, we saw examples of guerrilla warfare and the execution of a Lawrence County man, a neighbor of these men who switched sides and was killed after the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, we also discussed the unit's absorption in General Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee, serving under General Forrest in the West Tennessee Campaign actions around Nashville and Straits Raid. And to this point in the war, the unit experienced quite a bit of success and little adversity. Uh, and a couple other notes before we start part two is, is a reminder about the ease in which Captain James Reynolds escaped from Cairo after being captured at Parker's Crossroads. It was extremely easy for him to find shelter in the, in the middle of winter while traveling through Western Tennessee and Kentucky. A lot of pro-Confederate sentiment uh, in those areas. Also, the unit, other than its short forays into western Tennessee and chasing Straits Raiders, has stayed in or relatively close to its home recruitment area. So these soldiers aren't under much stress about leaving the command and going home. So I, also, as I mentioned last month, I'd like to make the presentation interactive. So anytime somebody's got a question, feel free to interrupt and I'll try to answer it the best I can. And we got some other good historians here. Sometimes if I can't answer, I'll pick on one of them to give an answer. Okay, we ended last month's presentation with Biffle's troops under the command of Forrest capturing Abel Straits Raiders just outside of Rome, Georgia, which occurred on May 3rd, 1863. To give some context of what's going on in the war at this time, You've got General Grant's Army of the Tennessee have landed south of Vicksburg, and they're making their march toward Jackson from Port Gibson. Uh, Confederate Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia is concluding their part in winning the Battle of Chancellorsville, and Lee will soon set his sights on invading the North, which will result in the Battle of Gettysburg two months later. Both these events will have an impact on operations in Middle Tennessee, the area that Biffle's troops are operating in. General Rosencrans, Union Army of the Cumberland, located now at Murfreesboro right here, and General Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee, is which is located at Tullahoma, uh, Rosencrans's offense is delayed by Strait's setback, but after much pushing from Washington, he finally advances his troops in mid-June. Confederates get intelligence that General Ambrose Burnside's Federal Army of the Ohio is being formed to move on Knoxville from Kentucky. That will later set in motion uh, Bragg's ultimately uh, failure by sending Morgan's raid into Kentucky and then he decides to go across the river into Ohio. So Biffle's command returns to this area operation in mid-May between the Duck River fronting Union troops at Franklin all the way down to the Alabama border following the Tennessee River on Bragg's left flank. General Earl Van Dorn, Biffle and Forrest Superiors, murdered in early May, and his division of cavalry is sent back to Mississippi due to Grant's move on Vicksburg. So that's a whole division of cavalry that leaves that area. An interesting story is told by Captain John Johnson of Company F, shown on the screen here, may explain how Biffle's command viewed Van Dorn. Upon getting orders to take Dr. Peters, Van Dorn's murderer, dead or alive, Captain Johnson told his company the order and then stated the following. Now I'll give you my orders as follows, said Johnson. Go and if you see Dr. Peters, and you have a better horse than his, you dismount and give him your horse, and you take his. If you have 50 cents in your pocket, and he hasn't any, give him a quarter of yours and tell him to go. <laughs> so they didn't think, uh, I think we can gather from this, they didn't think very much of Van Dorn. So Biffle's command returns 
uh, as I said, to its operation in mid-May, uh, General Greenville Dodge takes advantage of this situation as well with, with uh, Van Dorn's command leaving and the Confederates a little bit in disarray. And there's a disjointed Confederate command structure in the Florence and Tuscumbia area. They have uh, relieved General uh, Sam Wood and he is sent back to take over his uh, regiment in uh, Tullahoma. And when he leaves, you've got Roddy is given command essentially of the area. He puts one regiment of troops under Colonel Hannon north of the river while he keeps the rest of his troops south of the river, which means they're not very well supported. And then the Tennessee line divides Biffle's troops from that command. So basically got a little bit of a, of a command structure issue. Uh, Florence Corning lands his troops, a whole brigade of cavalry, in the Waterloo area, Savannah area, and marches down uh, the Cloverdale Road to Florence. Uh, during the raid to Florence, he dispatched 140 men of the 15th Illinois Cavalry to cover his northern flank and also to help him while he retreated from the Florence area. The Illinoisians were able to destroy Mar the Martin's Mill complex on Indian Creek in Wayne County before encountering parts of Biffle's regiment. They then beat a hasty retreat back to Savannah where Biffle's command demanding their surrender. The Yankee troops skirmished with Biffle's troops for a short while before the rebels retreated, most likely because they had intelligence that Union gunboats with part of Cornyn's command were approaching the town. Cornyn, after arriving in Savannah a few minutes or hours after the Confederates withdrew, sent a letter to Biffle shown above. Cornyn would later be brought up on court-martial charges related to his orders on this raid and earlier raids, uh, which basically he destroyed as much civilian property as he could. Uh, on August 10th, 1863, in his, during his court-martial trial, he would get in a fight with the second-in-command and he would get killed. So that's a very interesting story. If you've never read that, I suggest you look it up. It's his letter is just fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah. He, if you if you look at his stuff, that's the way he wrote everything. It was always, especially anything uh, to the newspaper or anything to anybody southern, it was always taunting. Your pompous letters. Yeah. In June uh, 1863, Rosencrantz finally makes a move toward Chattanooga, and this depicts Rosencrantz's army position in what's now called the Middle Tennessee Campaign. Bragg, who was in, who in the spring had more than a two-to-one advantage of cavalry, had suddenly lost that advantage as Van Dorn's division leaving, and then also sending, as I mentioned earlier, sending Morgan on a foolish raid into Kentucky that ultimately led to Morgan's force being captured. Bragg's forces around Tullahoma would eventually get outflanked and forced to retreat to Chattanooga. So they're basically, it's almost a bloodless campaign, uh, 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 Bragg being run out of Middle Tennessee. Uh, Biffle's 9th Tennessee Cavalry isn't involved with the main army as they've been sent into West Tennessee just days after tangling with Cornyn to raid and recruit and restore Confederate presence there. This is enabled by General Grant deciding to fully abandon the Louisville and Jackson Railroad and were drawing those forces to help with the siege at Vicksburg. And I kind of represented that by the blue. Uh, Biffle advanced from the, across the Tennessee from the Wayne County area and uh, Colonel Jeffrey Forrest advanced with the 10th Alabama Regiment and maybe some other troops from North Mississippi. Biffle's command made their presence known quickly. On June 15th, Major General R.J. Oglesby, who's later governor of uh, Illinois, at LaGrange, Tennessee, would communicate. General Dodge is sent out toward Jackson, Colonel Cornyn, to clean the country of Biffle's man. Biffle has torn the railroad up and destroyed wires for miles. I will not be able to repair it for weeks. Better let it go. Later that day, he would report a train broke through a culvert near Middleburg on the way to Bolivia, to Bolivar, this area here. I learned from a citizen today that the bridges and culverts are most of them destroyed on the road to Jackson. It will be impossible to repair the wires for a short time if it can be done at all. 
So quickly, he's, they're going back doing the same thing they did uh, in the previous December where they had basically tore uh, the railroad up going through the middle of western Tennessee. Two weeks later, on June 29th, Biffle's command engaged some 285 troopers of the 4th Missouri Cavalry and 80 troopers of the 15th Kentucky Cavalry, which your ancestor, Richard, was part of, between Jackson and Lexington. Not realizing they were outnumbered, they basically went there to break up rebel activity and then found themselves in a trap. You, realizing they were outnumbered and being encircled, they turned back towards their base only to be ambushed near a stream called Spring Creek, which is not too far from, from between Lexington and, and Jackson. The Yankee cavalrymen were harried all the way back to Fort Hyman with only 52 soldiers returning, though others dismounted with struggle in days later. Soldiers report that citizens at Clarksburg fired on them from houses during their retreat. Two lieutenant colonels were captured, um, and I verified that. I found both of their POW records, as well as several others in the command. At least 62 men were captured or killed, though the number based on Union reports may have been much higher. Within a week, the two Confederate commands began assembling recruits and conscripts at Jackson, swelling their numbers to over 2,000 soldiers, though most of the new recruits were poorly armed, if armed at all. Now, one of the things, Biffle at that time uh, had eight companies. During this raid, he would add two more from the recruits uh, that he gained from this. Plus, uh, uh, they would also send some of those uh, recruits or conscripts to other commands. In early July, and just to mention, Richard, I, this is that was the engagement your ancestor's brother got killed in. Is that correct? So, in early July, realizing that Confederate forces had set up a recruitment camp in Jackson, an oversized Union cavalry brigade under General Orion Hatch was sent there to push the Confederates out of the area. The movement resulted in skirmishes at Fort Deer Creek in Jackson, Tennessee, in the middle of July, 1863. Confederates, after significant fighting outside and inside the city of Jackson, would scatter, seemingly routed based on Union accounts. During this action, Colonel Fielding Hurst, also known as Hurst Worst, or the, his command was, would be charged for pillaging the town, resulting in his arrest. After paying a fine, he would be released, but later in the war he would demand the citizens of Jackson to pay his restitution or have the town put to the torch and they paid up. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing because in depositions, uh, soldiers from the 6th Tennessee blamed the 2nd Iowa and Michigan soldiers for doing all the pillaging. Uh, Confederate losses in killed and wounded captured perhaps approached 150 men, most captured, and of those, a good number were most likely the new recruits or conscripts. Federal losses most likely around 30 to 50 killed and wounded. In one of the uh, units there, the Second Iowa Regiment, uh, in their history, they they related they talked about the skirmish at Jackson on the 12th of July, a great deal. In one of the, uh, I'm going to read a comment that the author made about that. A little incident occurred here which deserves notice as showing the desperation with which some men will fight rather than surrender to a hated foe. During the charge just recorded. A squad of Company L overtook a rebel trooper and ordered him to surrender. He refused with an oath. One of the boys fired the ball passing through the rebel's body. He still urged his ste steed forward, onward, refusing the summons to surrender. Two more balls passed through him, but he still he halted not. When one of the boys, not relishing this butchery, dashed alongside of him and took his horse by the bridle, while another one seized the bleeding wretch by the collar, and dragged him to the ground. With a ghastly, though defiant look, he addressed his captors as follows. You can kill me, you can hold me, but I will never surrender to a damn Yankee. The boys held him for a few moments when he sank to the ground from loss of blood. And uh, I found that picture. I thought that characterized that event perfectly. Soon after the skirmish at Jackson, Tennessee, Union intelligence reported that the Confederates were crossing back over the Tennessee River trying to get back, uh, over to Bragg's army that was retreating toward Chattanooga. The Federals also learned that on July 10th, just two days prior to the skirmish at Jackson, Biffle's command had captured without a fight the garrison at Union City, Tennessee, which is almost at the Kentucky line. 
Uh, the captured troops, some 108 men, were ferried across the Tennessee River twice in order to get to Rome, Georgia. You can see what the Rome newspaper thought of the prisoners. They look, like, they look as vile and van, vagabondish as their sort generally are. They were carried off the train yesterday on their way to Richmond as we are informed. And you can see the article there in the paper. Private Stephen Jordan indicates that he and other Biffles Command were at Swallows Bluff near Clifton on the east side of the Tennessee River and were left there as the rest of the regiment went into West Tennessee. He mentions that L Lieutenant Colonel Cooper, who is also east of the Tennessee, Cooper's the guy who's in second in command. Private Jordan in his journal mentions that he takes a lot of Yankees captured in West Tennessee to Gadsden from Bainbridge. So they, they have a little bit of a, for like a line of communication, for lack of a better term. They're not really completely behind Union lines. They're able to go across the Tennessee at Bainbridge and across the Tennessee at Swallow Bluff to get to West Tennessee. But Rosencrantz's forces are now at, uh, just outside of Chattanooga. They basically have control of Huntsville, and they've got control that much. It won't be long before uh, the rest of the north part of the valley is, uh, in Alabama is going to be taken. One other note is essentially during this time period that the first two companies of the 2nd Tennessee Mounted Infantry are formed. The recruits are moved out of Biffle's area of control around Wayne County and is, is essentially while most of his command is fighting in West Tennessee. And you can get that at, out of uh, Soppert's book. Uh, this map shows primary Union bases in early September 863 just before the Battle of Chickamauga. The red arrows here indicates how Biffle's command moved from West Tennessee to the Battle of Chickamauga, because they fought there. It's a pretty good move to get there uh, from the time they were fighting in Middle Tennessee to Chickamauga. It appears that some of his command may have been present at the start of the battle, though others, as Private Jordan indicate, arrived after the battle had begun. And one other note, it's essentially, and you can see how the route is right here, in all the Union uh, commands uh, forces here, their post or the army and so forth. Here's a map uh, showing the Confederate right flank at the Battle of Chickamauga on September 19, 1863, the first day of heavy fighting uh, of that battle. Bivel's regiment is part of General George Gibb de Bruyne's brigade and would be engaged in trying to turn the Union left flank early in the morning of the first day. The fighting was intense and so this is the area and they're, they're attacking, and at the time, they had gotten around the Union flank. The uh, Union forces, under so much pressure in this area, had pulled back, and so when they made their attack, uh, the Union force was able to re refuse their line 90 degrees and knew they were coming. Um, General DHL, on seeing uh, Forrest Cavalry engaged in fighting Union infantry, would state, General Forrest, I wish to congratulate you and those brave men moving across the field like veteran infantry upon their magnificent behavior. No one can speak disparagingly of such troops as yours. Uh, Captain Johnson would talk about this attack years later saying, General Forrest dismounted his men, marched in line up a battle across the field. Bushes and briars were grown up thick. We crossed a fence to the road and were ordered to the left. I thought the Federals were all gone and left their tents. About that, the time the thought was fixed in my mind, I saw the tents fall. I realized then we were ambushed. There was a line of artillery under those tents. They fired on us. Their infantry came on us in tremendous force. We went back over the field. So... Uh, Infantry, you know, cavalry don't fight well as infantry when they're fighting other infantry, and uh, that's probably, especially in a major battle like this. Uh, Debril would later write in his after-action report the following. On the morning of the 19th, we moved to the right of the infantry and got up in time to join in a heavy skirmish then going on. We occupied the right of the infantry on the 19th and 20th and were in several very hotly contested engagements. On the 21st, we were ordered forward and engaged the enemy in the gap of Missionary Ridge during the afternoon, losing several men and killed and wounded. On the 22nd, we moved forward again and came up with the enemy near Rossville, and after skirmishing during the entire day, succeeded in driving the enemy to the point of Lookout Mountain 
losing several more in killed and wounded. On the 23rd, we skirmished all day with the enemy at the point of Lookout Mountain, and theirs being a superior infantry force and our, our orders being only to hold the ground we had. So after five days of skirmishing and fighting, Dibble will report the following losses of his brigade. And just to pick out the 9th Tennessee, they had one killed and seven wounded. So uh, while they were engaged, especially really after the skirmish and after the battle chasing them back, uh, you know, they weren't probably as engaged as some of the other regiments. The brigade in total had 18 killed and 63 wounded, six missing. There was one other comment here that, that Dibral made. He said they captured at least a thousand stands of arms, a large lot of supplies, and fully 500 prisoners. We were kept constantly on the move, engaged, and as fast as prisoners were captured, they were sent to the rear and no account kept of them. The arms were gathered in wagons. The command armed itself completely with Springfield and infield muskets. And this is how Confederate troops normally got armed uh, in a lot of cases during the war, especially when the blockade took over. Well, this wasn't a raid. This is because they... Yeah. Well, the, the ammunition was in, you know, in Chickamauga is a little different because Chickamauga, they were able to uh, basically drive the Union forces off the field. So they, they got a lot of, uh, when an when army retreats like that, you get a lot of arms and ammunition. Uh, normally, uh, you know, they're not going to get that much, depending on what the kind of fight happens. If it's a, you know, but, but there were thousands of Union troops that retreated in a very quick manner, and a lot of them threw the uh, guns to to the ground uh, on the Union right. Greg, there's an account too that uh, G.H. Hill wrote. You know, he was with Longstreet, of course, came up from Ringo mm -hmm. on the second day. And as soon as he came to the battlefield, Forrest was driving the Union forces back across Alexander Bridge like he was talking. And he rode up. And Forrest was out there in his shirt sleeve on horseback leading his men. And G.H. Hill wondered who that farmer was out there in the middle of the field. <laughs> <laughs> so that's General Forrest. Oh. <laughs> The well, it's, it's an interesting thing about that battle now because, uh, you know, there's, there's a, there have been a book written that, that really uh, faults Forrest for a lot of mistakes on the first day. And so it's, but, uh, you know, that can be studied at a different time. Soon after the Battle of Chickamauga, uh, Bragg decides to raid the Union supply line of the besieged federal defenders at Chattanooga. The raid takes place in early October 1863 and is shown here on the map. Basically, far, Wheeler goes up to Cottonport and crosses the river there and goes down and around the Union forces, eventually crossing at Muscle Shoals. Uh, Wheeler first approached about the raid, uh, objected to Bragg, saying he didn't have enough healthy troops to make it and requested some of Forrest's command for sufficient force. Uh, Forrest made the same complaint when Wheeler approached Forrest about the troops, or Bragg had ordered Forrest about the troops, Forrest made the same complaint as Wheeler, but not to no avail, which led to Forrest leaving Bragg's army, and, and, uh, and he took only a battalion and his escort, and uh, perhaps a battery, if I remember correctly, and the rest of them were assigned to Wheeler's command, including Biffle's regiment. Wheeler soon discovered that Forrest's troops were in worse shape than his, stating, the three brigades from General Forrest were mere, mere skeletons, scarcely averaging 500 effective men each. They were badly armed and had but a small supply of ammunition, and their horses were in horrible condition, having been marched continuously for three days and nights without removing saddles. Uh, that speaks to what Debril has said. The men were worn out and without rations. Uh, that kind of conflicts with uh, what Debril has said about the whole command, uh, his whole uh, brigade being rearmed. Forrest's subordinates, most likely Biffle among them, voiced their opinion that not only were their troops not up to the mission, but also that the men resented having to serve uh, under Wheeler again. A lot of them were upset about what had happened at Dover. Uh, I believe some of Biffle's men might have been at Dover when uh, Wheeler and uh, Forrest had their dispute there, uh, but that's another story. Uh, from the records, it appears that all of Debril's brigade was left behind, but federal records on the raid, but federal records indicate that some of Biffle's troops may have accompanied Wheeler's troops to get back to the Wayne County area to recruit and support Confederate resistance there. 
This small contingent of Biffle's men could also have traveled back through North Alabama across Tennessee around most shows, but they were there. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. Meanwhile, while Wheeler's command was gone, Colonel DeBrill took his brigade north of Chattanooga along the Tennessee River to drive out Federal cavalry advancing from Knoxville. He developed a well-designed plan working with Colonel James Morrison's Georgia Cavalry Brigade to surround a Union Cavalry force under Colonel Frank Wolford. They were Kentuckians. The engagement occurred in Philadelphia, Tennessee along the East Tennessee and Georgia Railroad on October 29, 1863. And that's in this, this area up here. Uh, Union forces had recently, uh, under Burnside, had recently captured Knoxville and were coming down to, for, to the aid of uh, Rosencrantz. DeBrill's command skirmished with Walford's Kentuckians while they waited for Morrison's and Georgians to get in the Yankee rear. When DeBrill heard the firing behind the Yankee lines, he launched his attack, putting and routed the Kentuckys and putting the Yankee command to flight. Most of the heavy fighting took place with the Georgians as Wolford's troopers had to storm their lines to escape. Federal losses were seven killed, 25 wounded, 447 captured. The Confederates lost 15 killed, 82 wounded, and 70 captured. Deborah reported on losing one killed and three captured. In, kit, in equipment, the Confederates captured six artillery pieces, 50 wagons loaded with stores, going back to what you were asking, 10 ambulances, 75 beef cattle, which is always a good thing to capture, and an unspecified number of mules and horses. The battle stalled Union forces under Burnside from advancing further down the, the valley in relief of Chattanooga as Burnside felt he could get trapped in a large engagement with Confederate forces without adequate intelligence. So here's cavalry's beaten back, uh, demoralized. He, he doesn't believe he has a good enough eyes not to get into trouble. So he turns back to Knoxville. A couple of weeks later, on the 5th of November, Biffle's command, sent on a scout by Connor, Colonel DeBurrell, were ambushed at Motley's Ford while crossing the Tennessee River near London, Tennessee. And that would be in this area up in here. The remainder of DeBurrell's brigade hurriedly gathered up their guns and by firing at the enemy across the river, drove them off. The 9th Tennessee Cavalry lost 25 men captured and three wounded. Stephen Jordan would write in his diary, the Yankees charged us and run us through the river in great confusion. We lost 30 men captured. It was a very ugly affair. So everything didn't always go great for their command. Uh, Biffle scouting was a precursor to Longstreet's Knoxville campaign, which would end in failure and his departure ensured Bragg's defeat at Chattanooga a few weeks later. The Confederates had decided to uh, basically send Longstreet's Long uh, 10,000 men north to, to try to take Knoxville. Wheeler, with his, part of his cavalry, was sent up the Tennessee Valley ahead of Longstreet's infantry on the 13th. Dibble's command surprised Union Carry Cavalry at Maryville, uh, just outside the Smoky Mountains, by making a night march and attacking them at daybreak, capturing a significant number of pr prisoners, reportedly as high as 250. <coughs> Biffle's cavalry would support Longstreet's siege of Knoxville and then they would have to retreat northeastward to Rogersville to go into winter quarters when Union reinforcements arrived to break the siege in early December. The Confederates suffered greatly during this time. They were ill-clothed, poorly sheltered, and badly supplied while, win while in winter quarters there. They had, before they started on the expedition, they had expected a lot of supplies on the railroad that Bragg had uh, told them would be there in Cleveland, and they never received them. And then when Bragg uh, was uh, defeated at the Battle of Chattanooga, that railroad line was severed. Confederate cavalry commands were sent out to forge long distances from their base at at Rogersville. This led to several large cavalry skirmishes. Biffle's command were involved in most of these fights. One at Mossy Creek on, the, on December 24th and 29th, in which Private Jordan were right on the, the, the fight on the 29th, had a big fight, drove the Yankees five miles. They were largely reinforced and drove us back. The Yankee cavalry charged us and put us in great confusion for a while. We rallied and checked them, killing a good many 
We lost several in our regiment. I came very near being captured and killed, but I thank God I made my escape. I shot at a Yankee officer 40 yards from me. Jordan would note on January 8th, 1864, as they went on another forage and ex expedition, cold and clear, snow two inches deep. Had to cross the Chucky and French Broad Rivers to get corn. Horse fell down in the Chucky. Went on picket 10 miles from camp on Morristown Road. On January 28th, while at Fair Garden, Tennessee, Private Jordan would write, while lying in camp, Yankees cut off our vedettes and charged our pickets into camp, which created confusion for a few minutes, but we formed our brigade in line, threw up some logs and rails, and met the Yankees and whipped them badly. We lost but few killed and wounded. DeBrill would write about this uh, encounter later. And the 9th Tennessee under Colonel Biffer was placed in front on the right of the road with the 8th Tennessee upon the left of the road and to the left and rear of the 9th. The 10th and 4th to the left of the 8th and the 11th and the 3rd Arkansas the right of Biffle. So they had Biffle right in the middle and also being supported. The position was a strong one, but if abandoned, the chance of escape was bad. And Dibble went on to say, more or less, that if the 9th had no chance to escape, should the line not hold. The fighting lasted for hours until nightfall, with part of the Confederate line pushed back on the left but retaken. Dibble went on. The enemy's loss was currently reported at not less than 300, while our entire loss was two killed and 18 wounded. It was one of the hardest fought battles the brigade was ever engaged in. They fought a force greatly superior in numbers, flush with their victory of the day before, and most gallantly won the day. When night came on and the battle ended, the brigade was almost out of ammunition. Dibble would be wounded in this action, and General Biffle, as a senior colonel, was named the brigade commander until Dibble could return from his injuries. The brigade would have a quiet February and March, an interesting observation would from uh, Private Jordan's during this time was that he would often write letters home and he sent them by the way of Bainbridge or Florence. So he knew people in that area, he sent the letter there and they would get the letters to Middle Tennessee. His home was in Maury County near uh, Spring Hill. On March 24th, 1864, Confederate inspectors from Richmond arrived at the brigade's base on the Chucky River. The inspectors noticed that Biffle is in command of the brigade but the date of his commission is now under investigation. They also point out that the 9th Cavalry doesn't exist on paper. Another 9th Tennessee Cavalry exists under a Colonel Ward, and they are confused why there is a second 9th Tennessee Cavalry. The letter shown here is written by, in the middle here, is written by Colonel DeBrell in support of Biffle and noting his command's performance and details of service of the unit and Colonel Dib uh, Biffle. Eventually, Biffle's regiment is redesignated the 19th Tennessee Cavalry. Rosters are found and Biffle is granted a commission. This takes time due to bureaucratic red tape. The command leaves before the end of the month to join the Confederate Army of Tennessee between Atlanta and Chattanooga. During the Atlanta campaign that's, that's coming up, Biffle's 9th Tennessee Cavalry is still shown to be the 9th Tennessee Cavalry and, and to be in command by Captain James Reynolds, not Colonel Biffle, on all official returns. It isn't until late summer before Biffle's name is shown on any return as being back in command. Uh, Captain Reynolds' record showed also that he's absent from the command during the inspection. So where is Reynolds? We've had all this fight in the 9th Tennessee. You, you see where they're, or the 19th Tennessee. Well, it may be Captain Reynolds and other from Biffle's command is in Wayne County area doing guerrilla activities. Uh, we talked earlier about Wheeler's Raid in Chattanooga, uh, how some of those troops uh, might have got there. A few days after that raid, on October 14, 1863, a Union spy reported that there is one Captain M.L. Kirk that has a company there belonging to Colonel Biffle's Rebel Regiment. Kirk has killed several Union men in cold blood and is a terror to all Union sentiment. A few weeks later, after Dodge's forces moved into the area occupying Pulaski and trying to control all areas north of the Tennessee River, a Major Thomas Gibson 
reported to him that on November 2nd, 1863, after getting deserters from the camp of Colonel Albert Cooper at Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, that Cooper's force was about two to 300 strong and were holding loyal Union citizens in the jail there. This Cooper would be uh, Lieutenant Colonel Albert Cooper of Bivfels, 9th Tennessee Cavalry. Gibbons would fight a skirmish with the rebel troopers, which generated an amazing four-page report on his part, which I don't have time to read here, but it's, I read it again trying to figure out how I could talk about it, but if uh, I need to make some printouts and show some of you later. Uh, it, he, he makes Cornyn look like a child when it comes to writing. Gibson was able to free the prisoners, but found out he was a head outnumber and he had to flee. But it sounded like he annihilated Biffle's force or Cooper's force the whole time while he was fleeing. So that was I found that interesting. A few weeks later, we find this dispatch from Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jesse Phillips, who spent quite a bit of time in this area during the war, and he writes to General Dodge on December first, eighteen sixty-three, several weeks later. One company, which formerly belonged to Biffle's regiment, reorganized between Mount Pleasant and Lawrenceburg under Lewis Kirk and crossed to the south side of the Tennessee for purpose of joining the regiment about the 27th of November. He, Kirk, has been cooperating with Cooper in the vicinity of Lawrenceburg for some weeks past. On December 6th, a few days later, Colonel Miller mentions that in, his, in the previous week, he engaged a squad under Captain Kirk between Lexington and Bainbridge while moving towards the military road and skirmished with Captain Reynolds' company at Wayland Springs the next day. He skirmishes with Kirk's command again uh, later that afternoon and mentions chasing squads of Reynolds' command uh, in the area. One of the captures of his command makes is, is Captain Reynolds' brother, uh, Wesley B. Reynolds. Family Pass Me Downs states that Private Reynolds' neighbor walked up to him after he was captured and shot him while he was being held a prisoner. So uh, I bring that out talking about the, we talked about Kirk doing things, you got Reynolds doing things, we've already talked about the, the uh, neighbor versus neighbor, brother against brother was pretty strong in that area. By this time, the nucleus companies of the 2nd Tennessee Mounted Infantry are operating out of Clifton and Waynesburg under Major Murphy, who will later be named Colonel of the Regiment. In official dispatches, they are called Home Guards. During this period, the winter of 1863-64, the eye for an eye revenge motivation begins playing itself out between Biffle's command and the 2nd Tennessee Mounted Infantry. The Booger Saga and Captain T.J. Seipert's memoir, who was captain in the 2nd Tennessee, cite many of these examples of war crimes uh, on both sides. On January 3rd, Captain Jonathan Biffle, who is uh, captain of Camp Company A of the 9th, uh, is captured in Tennessee. Uh, the POW record on foe 3 shows he was taken in Tennessee. It doesn't show whether he was taken in East Tennessee or in Wayne County and historical records conflict each other. So some, something I'm still working on to figure out. Another interesting thing is I was looking through some of these records. There was a Private James Beavis captured on March 26th in Lardale County that was in Biffle's command. He later escaped on April 3rd, 1864 when he jumped through the windows of a railroad car. Seipert also mentions that his command is constantly harassed by guerrillas, which may be parts of Biffle's command. And this is all through the spring of 1864, while Biffle's command is in East Tennessee. On the 22nd, 23rd, and 31st, 1864, Biffle's command is noted to have made attacks on the 2nd Tennessee Mounted Infantry's main base at Clifton, Tennessee. On the attack of the 31st, the post is given the demand to surrender signed by Colonel Biffle himself. However, Biffle is being ID'd by Captain Johnson and being around Atlanta at the same time. So where's Biffle at? Is he in Atlanta? He's not, records so he's not in there, but this there. It's, it's, it's one reason why people have a lot of trouble figuring out 
whether Biffle's command was a frontline Confederate cavalry unit or a guerrilla, a regulars. Later that summer on August 11, 1864, as Biffle's cavalry is moving north from Atlanta on Wheeler's Road, Private Jacob D. Biffle is shot five times after surrendering. His companion is also shot. We'll talk a little bit more about all that at the end of the presentation. Going back to Dibble's, where Dibble's Brigade, which is Biffle's Tennessee Cavalry is in, the end of March 1864, they're moving in a roundabout way from East Tennessee through the mountains of North Carolina and South Carolina, arriving in Georgia after a very strenuous two weeks march. They went through Asheville, Greenville, South Carolina, uh, all the way down to Athens, Georgia, and then back up from, the, uh, from Atlanta toward Dalton. By, by early May, Bivol's command is at the front facing General William T. Sherman's Union Army as it heads towards Atlanta down the Chattanooga and Atlanta Railroad. DeBrill noted distinguished fighting by the 9th Tennessee two times in front of Rocky Face Ridge between the 7th and 13th of May before the Army retreated to Resaca. At Resaca, Private Jordan noted in his journal that the 9th recaptured a hospital from federal troops. DeBrill also noted this in his memoir. He said, during the day, the brigade recaptured the hospital of General Hyman's command that had been captured by the enemy. The charge was led by Biffle and the 9th, supported by the 8th Tennessee Cavalry. In this charge, the gallant and handsome Jack Nicholson, son of the judge, A.O.P. Nicholson, charged through the enemy's lines and was killed in the rear. He was a member of the 9th. Biffle's command was involved in many skirmishes along the line of retreat at Calhoun, at Cartersville, at New Hope Church, at Dallas. They often fought as infantrymen during that time. They were also in front of Kennesaw Mountain. Uh, they would fight in trenches on the flanks. Uh, they were used as infantry when commands were moved uh, because of their mobility when commands were moved to one side or other to counter Sherman's flanking movements. And so they're, they're, they were quite versatile the way Johnson used them. On the 24th of May, Jordan reported in his journal that the Cavalry Corps went into the rear of the Yankees at Cassville, captured 100 prisoners and wagons, and traveled nearly all night to get there. During this movement, Captain Johnson reported that his company captured and brought out some 82 wagons of Union supplies, and according to Johnson, one of the wagons contained dog tents, which his company took liberty to possess. Johnson stated, Several days later, we went into camp, and I had the men put their tents in two rows facing each other. Men from headquarters and all over came to him wanting to know where he got those tents. He refused to tell, just saying we got them honorably. At the Chattahoochee River, Dibble's command were among the last to cross and were in lively skirmish for several hours. After the crossing of the, the uh, was ordered up the river to resist the advance of the enemy who had cr effected a crossing near Roswell Factory. At this point, the Confederate Army is in the defenses around Atlanta, and General Sam Hood is taking command. So they've retreated all the way down over the last uh, couple of months, and they're, this is the summer of 1864, and they're in their defenses. General Sam Hood uh, doesn't believe really in using cavalry a lot to help with the infantry as much, and Biffle's troopers are either static or dismounted in trenches or moving to other trenches to counter, as I talked earlier about Sherman's flanking movements. And they were doing this lot because Hood made lots of attacks, Peachtree Creek, Battle of Atlanta, and when he pulled infantry out to make those attacks or flanking movements, he stuck cavalry troops in there. And that's uh, what they did a lot of. On August 10th, 1864, Biffle's command goes with General Joe Wheeler on a raid to cut the Union communications around Atlanta. The movement is ineffective, and Atlanta falls on September 2nd. Here's a map that shows roughly the route of uh, Wheeler's command took on the raid. And if you look, they went from Atlanta toward Chattanooga, trying to tear the railroad up there. And then their plan was to, to get across the Tennessee, at either at Bridgeport or near Chattanooga, and then get to the railroad between Nashville and Chattanooga, disrupting the supply line. 
and they weren't able to. They had to go all the way up to Knoxville before they could get across. Wheeler fails to destroy with any substance any of the railroad between Nashville to Chattanooga to Atlanta. Command has a difficult time in finding a place to cross the Tennessee and pushes all the way to Knoxville, taking away precious time and allowing Yankee cavalry to regroup to oppose the raid. Captain Johnson makes one interesting comment as the command was opposite Knoxville and Johnson was placed on picket duty there. He states, General Wheeler went back to camp about four miles away, leaving me with a small squad of face, facing 3,000 Federals not more than one half mile away. He told me to send two men across the river on a pontoon bridge into Knoxville. I told him I would not force my men to walk into what seemed certain death. He told me to ask for volunteers. I told him I had two men on scout duty that would take the lighting going and would tell them when they came in. Wheeler finally crosses the Tennessee and advances into Middle Tennessee, he loses his best divisional commander, General John H. Kelly, in a difficult fight at Franklin, Tennessee on September 2nd. Many Tennesseans drop out of the raid and stop for a few days at home. Dibrell's brigade becomes split up as Dibrell moves toward Chattanooga to recruit while Biffle stays with Wheeler's main command and heads towards Muscle Shoals. Captain Johnson mentions that General Kelly is shot within 40 yards of him in that battle at Franklin. He has mentioned Kelly several times prior in his memories of the war and he has a very high esteem of him. Johnson states that Wheeler has ordered the command to charge a well-fortified position at Franklin. Johnson states that Kelly tells him, Captain, this is not my fight. This is General Wheeler's fight. And there's a lot of Confederate cavalrymen that, that I've read says the same thing. That was a mistake to have the fight at Franklin when they could have went around the Yankees there. Private Jordan shows that he left the main command with several others on September 1st, and he rejoins his command on the 5th. He's involved in the fight at Campbellsville that same day, and moved on to camp at Lawrenceburg with the Biffle's command. On the 6th, Jordan notes that Biffle's command moves to Wayne County while Wheeler heads towards Florence. Wheeler waits for a few days for Dibble's command to show up, but Dibble can't do the Union Cavalry between him and Wheeler, and he's forced to retreat into East Tennessee. Biffle's half of the brigade just stays in Wayne County, unconcerned about staying with Wheeler. The rest of Wheeler's command finally moves across the Tennessee at Bainbridge and the Colbert Shoals, pushed closely by the closing Federal cavalry. Biffle's command would never serve under Wheeler again, and Captain Johnston expressed his happiness in that in his memoir. After a few days in camp in Wayne County, on September 19th, Private Jordan leaves the command to travel back to his home in Maury County. After a few days, he realizes he may not be safe there and begins to hide out. Here is a, one passage in his journal during that time. September 27th, in the Hurricane Foster field. Cloudy and rain this evening. Stayed last night at Foster's Corn Pen. Remained here all day. As Biffle's command rested in the Wayne County, Tennessee area, he formulated a plan to destroy the 2nd Tennessee Mounted Infantry. The plan, more or less, was to lure Colonel Murphy's troopers into a trap in rural Hickman County. The result of this is called the Battle of Centerville, which occurred on September 26 and 27, 1864. Captain Johnson mentions the fight as a battle with Colonel Hurst, 6th Cavalry, whose Biffle's men had tangled with him West Tennessee in 1863, but that wasn't the case. Both sides took a number of casualties, perhaps as many as 30 or more on each side, Murphy's men escaped the trap and retreated to Nashville. Biffle would learn that Forrest had crossed the river on a raid, and whether they participated, and whether they participated or not after the Battle of Centerville is unclear. Forrest at that time was threatening Pulaski with intent to move to move further into Middle Tennessee. So Forrest had crossed at the Colbert Shoals, came over to Athens where he had Sulphur Creek and the Battle of Athens, and then the day the Battle of Centerville is taking place, he's fighting Union troops at Pulaski. Forrest would later go on move up toward the Chattanooga and Nashville Railroad and then back over toward the Spring area before he would actually move back uh, to Florence. We would cross the river. 
Many of Biffle's troops, including Private Jordan, would join up with Forrest as he retreated across the river. Jordan talks in his memoir about staying on Seven Mile Island for several days, avoiding Yankee detection while the command ferried over to the other side. Some of Biffle's command remained in Wayne County, including Captain Johnson, for he makes no mention of crossing the Tennessee. It's not clear if any of Biffle's command traveled to Johnsonville on Forrest's next raid there a few weeks later. Jordan travels to Iuka and gets sick, but makes no mention of what, where Biffle's command is doing. So it's kind of unclear at this time if, if there's just parts of it here, parts of it there, or Biffle, where Biffle is in particular. Uh, some portion, if they went with uh, Forrest to Johnsonville, may have crossed the river with Rucker's troop, troops. Is there an indication that most of Biffle's soldiers are in Wayne County just prior to Hood's advance toward Nashville, which is upcoming. So now we got the Hood's Tennessee campaign. Uh, General John Bell Hood's Army of Tennessee arrives in the area in late eight, October 1864 while Forrest troops are heading towards Johnsonville. Part of Biffle's command is in Wayne County, as we mentioned earlier, while some may be with Forrest and others at Iuka, Mississippi. While Hood is waiting in Florence, there are Union intelligence reports that place Biffle and Rucker's forces on Indian Creek in Wayne County. When Hood leaves for his upcoming battles at Franklin and Nashville, they are, uh, Biffle is in uh, char uh, command of Biffle's Demi Brigade, as it's called under General James Calmer's division. And so they, he is, they know enough about Biffle that they've actually placed uh, the troops uh, in a command structure. Uh, during the advance north, Biffle's brigade is, a, uh, is engaged in routes of Union Cavalry at Henryville and a running fight with Union Cavalry between Mount Pleasant all the way to Columbia, where they almost cut off uh, Union infantry retreating from Pulaski. They didn't quite get there in time. Uh, they were on the Confederate left flank at the Battle of Franklin, and they were in Biffle's brigade, Demi Brigade, was placed on the Confederate right flank at Nashville. At the battle there, they, along with much of the Confederate right, were nearly cut off from their line of retreat down the Pulaski Pike. Captain Johnson tells a tale where he's discussing events with Colonel Biffle and General Bushrod Johnson. While looking over the higher rank, ranking officer's shoulders, Johnson more or less states that the Confederate line is broken. Biffle declares to Captain Johnson, that is mutiny, sir. He was most likely embarrassed by Johnson's words in front of the general. Johnson retorts, I'll stay here as long as you do, <laughs> which wasn't very long. The command travels all night before on this route before they reach safety behind infantry lines, but the next day they are on the run again looking for a place to reform just north of Franklin. Johnson reports that he's taken one portion of the command towards Franklin and halts it to re reconnoiter. Johnson relates as he goes up on top of a ridge, I saw a whole sea of blue coats between us and Rank Franklin. I saw Colonel Buffle a half a mile in front of me running his horse at full tilt and about a half a dozen Yankees shooting at him. Johnson comes back down and told his company, we aren't going to Franklin that way. Biffle and Johnson both get to Franklin unscathed and are able to put their unit back together and are part of Forrest's rear guard on the retreat from Columbia to the most shows. Private Jared Gresham, perhaps wounded or just tired of the war, is left with relatives in Lexington, Alabama. He was in Reynolds' command in Company B. Nevertheless, what is left of Biffle's command crosses the pontoon bridge at Bainbridge. They're part of Chalmers' division, which doesn't arrive to Selma later in the war in time for that defense of that city, hence this is their last action of the Civil War. So, the aftermath. On May 3rd, just prior to the surrender of Pearl, Biffle's regiment is reported as 22 officers, 281 men present, 257 effectives, aggregate present and absent of 508. It was paroled at Gainesville, Alabama, and on the right here, this here is 
Colonel Biffle's parole. When I look, Johnson's there, Reynolds is there, Kirk is there. So, so there are three of the guys I've talked about as captains. They all have paroles from uh, that surrender. Following Biffle's regiment during the Civil War, you see several contrasting themes. It was recruited as a partisan ranger outfit, but had significant combat experience fighting near major concentrations of entry. They were effective raiders, recruiters, conscriptors, but they also fought in some of the largest battles of the Western theater. They are labeled often as nothing more than Confederate guerrillas by many credible authors, but I think I've demonstrated here at Biffle's command is as an effective cavalry force as any that fought during the war. The confusing part is how they were able to keep soldiers in and out of the Wayne County area. Even Biffle himself appears to have been in two places at the same time when he sent that surrender ultimatum to the base at Clifton. So, you know, where I'm at is on that is that he made a pact with his, and this is an opinion, but he made a pact with his soldiers when they signed up to be partisan rangers and they would fight at home. He made sure he always had a company or two that could go back there and spend some time. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. There's too much communication about their soldiers being there, and if you look at the captures, you see quite a few captures during times when the main force is in Atlanta or in East Tennessee. So does anybody know who is the person on the left there? Ray Owens. That's correct. You would think, so you, would, you know some people know their Western history. Private Clay Allison was a, a member of Company F in the Ninth Tennessee, and after the war he killed a guy named Chuck Colbert. thought that was interesting because of Colbert County during a dinner at a place called the Clifton House. And that was his, his first killing after the war that was documented. People asked Allison later why he accepted a dinner invitation from a man likely to try to kill him. There was apparently a blood feud between these two guys. And Allison replied, because I didn't want to send a man to hell on any empty stomach. <laughs> uh, the other person, uh, Another person here that we've talked about is Captain James Reynolds. We talked about him mostly in the first part. He left Wayne County and died in Oklahoma of old age. One of his brothers was bushwhacked in Wayne County several years after the war. And most of the Reynolds family living in Tennessee uh, migrated west after that event. Captain James Johnson, uh, who told a wonderful story about his time during the Civil War to his daughter who wrote this all down. And it's published in the most shows, uh, and I think you were editor of that when it was published, it, wasn't you, Richard? The uh, yeah, journal most shows history. We're lucky to have that information. Uh, he uh, he lived in Colbert County and died there uh, in his later years. He lived in Arkansas quite a number of years before moving here. Private Stephen Jordan, who we talked about his journal. Uh, he lived to be 69 years of age, and he died at Maury County, probably near the same place as, that was his home during the war. He, he spent a lot of time, and you can tell from his journal, you get the impression about how much time he was able to get back home and not necessarily at his command. It's probably a very inordinate amount when you compare to other, uh, say, a Confederate infantry soldier. Captain Lewis Kirk. Uh, and we've talked about him a little bit in both parts. He was arrested at his home by Yankee soldiers a couple months after the war. A New York Times article stated that it was due to the fact that he was the perpetrator of General McCook's death, and they gave the particulars on why that was. Uh, there's no doubt that, that Kirk was not the uh, perpetrator. They were still trying to get Frank Gurley, who we talked a little bit about the first part, who was a member of... Uh, 4th Alabama Regiment uh, hanged for that crime uh, or so-called crime. Uh, it was Confederate, so it was legitimate as we talked about. Uh, but anyway, regardless of whether Kirk was held for that cause or was held for something other, he was, he was taken out of prison on Pulaski, Tennessee one day to act as a guide for the Union Army. Uh, he returned shot for trying to escape. So there was no trial, so we really don't know much. I still look, look for some documents to...
try to explain that. And finally, Colonel Jacob Biffle, maybe maligned, maybe not, uh, is a very interesting character for, sh for sure. Uh, like Reynolds, he left Wayne County not long after the war was over due to the strife in Wayne County, and he moved to Texas. There he was killed by his cook during a roundup, supposedly after an argument. Uh, some of his family believe it was a contract killing related to his activities during the war. And they actually believe it has nothing to do with anything that happened in Wayne County. They think it was actually something that happened during the early days. And, you know, uh, a Biffle researcher is trying to get what that is, but that hasn't been w revealed. They have some kind of document they've never shown people or journal, I think. And that's it.